Hello and welcome to chapter 39 of the American pageant for U.S. history or AP U.S. history or college U.S. history or any American history because it's the best. Today we're doing uh, the first section of chapter 39, the stalemated 70s. Oh man, the 70s. 1968 to 1980. This one's going to cover um, the sources of stagnation to Nixon's detente with Beijing and Moscow. So let me just tell you a couple things about the 70s. Not a great decade. The 60s, a lot of fun stuff, good music, you know, hippies and peace and love and harmony and all that. The 70s, you have disco, you have bad hair, you have bad clothes, polyester leisure suits, you have uh, too many chemicals or drogas malas, um, the Beatles are broke up, you have three buffoons as president, you have scandals, you have an oil embargo, you have hostages, uh, there's Watergate, there's Three Mile Island, the worst nuclear disaster in American history. But hey, the highlights is there was a really good fireworks show for the 200th birthday of the United States. Some good movies, The Godfather, Star Wars, uh, and the birth of Gen X. The, you know, whatever. That's us. I'm, I'm Gen X. I was born in the 70s, but we're, we're just, that's us. We're losers. So let's get into it here. Ah, uh, this, the economy finally slows down. After 25 years of growth, 25 years of prosperity, the economy slows down in the 1970s, and so the whole decade, uh, president after president, Nixon to Ford to Carter, you know, and these are three different parties, or two different parties. You have Republicans and Democrats. They deal with all these issues, uh, and it's just multi-layered, multifaceted, and nobody can fix it, really. It's just kind of a downturn for the American economy. There are more women and teens entering the workforce. That's that's kind of a good thing. And there's a, there's a little typo there. I'll fix that for later. Sorry. Uh, you have the deteriorating machinery and new regulations that are hindering growth. There's things, you know, people actually realize that you shouldn't just, you know, kill the environment and pollute all the time. Uh, Vietnam was putting a strain on the economy. And also the Great Society contribute to inflation. That much money being infused in the economy causes prices to go up. You also have the return, the resurgence of Europe and Japan and Asia in manufacturing. Uh, after you know, their destruction of World War II, it took a while for them to get back. But now Japan was flooding the U.S. market with cheap uh, cars, uh, well-made cars, uh, and also electronics. German goods are coming back, um, and so they're competing. It's not just the Americans you know, making everything in the world again. Um, they're making, they're contributing steel, automobiles, consumer electronics. Uh, you have the Volkswagen Bug. Uh, you have the Toyota Corolla, which arrived in the 70s. This is the Honda Civic here. Uh, look a little different than they do now. Meanwhile, you have probably one of the worst eras of American cars in history. I mean, the early 70s, you got some really cool muscle cars, the Charger, you know, Mustang, the Camaro. But then you have the birth of AMC, the American Motor Company. Uh, you have the AMC Pacer. You have the Pinto. Uh, <laughs> just some awful, awful... Uh, that's a Ford Pinto, but uh, this this you might recognize. This is from uh, Wayne's World. Just terrible cars. This uh, this this company went bankrupt. Um, actually, Chrysler bought them out, and all they wanted was the Jeep. Everything else was trash. Uh, this is you know nominal uh, wages. So this is how much wages went up. So how much people made in U.S. dollars from 1950? They're making around five thousand dollars, and then you fast forward to 2008, they're making fifty thousand dollars. Hey, that's really good. But when you compare it and adjust it to inflation, you can see slight growth from 1950 to 1970. And then actually, because of inflation, the uh, the real wages go down. And it's really stagnated just a little bit of a peak before uh, the Great Recession of 2008. But largely, wages have stayed stagnant since 1950. And so you're making the same money today as people were in 1950 in terms of your purchasing power. So, Nixon's foreign policy. So, when he was elected, he said he was going to run on a peace with honor campaign. And so, his new strategy is a three-part plan. Uh, one, he's going to reform the draft. The most hated aspect of the Vietnam War, he's going to reform that. Uh, they did one more draft. All 19-year-olds were eligible. They were chosen by a lottery. They had a big, like, bingo thing and ping-pong balls, and they twirled it. And whatever birthdays came out, they were selected. There was no deferments. If you're in college, you went. Uh, I know from uh, talking to older individuals that one of the dates that was picked in 1971 was July 27th. A, a, a friend of mine that I used to coach his kids was drafted. I know that because he had the same birthday as me. I'm a lot younger. Uh, but his birthday was pulled. Uh, he was medically unfit, but he was drafted but didn't have to serve in the military. Uh, they also began pulling troops out of Vietnam and letting the South Vietnamese fight more. This is called the Vietnamization of the war. 
So it is a civil war. We're going to let them fight their fight. We're going to slowly pull out. And so that's kind of appeasing people that wanted peace. But it's also we're not going to just uh, turn our backs on them. Um, you can see the, the troop uh, dwindling numbers. For their, at its peak, when Nixon took over, there's 540,000 troops in 1969. By 1970, 334,000. By 1971, there's only 60,000 troops. And then the third part was an expanded bombing campaign in North Vietnam. And so for that honor part, they're going to bomb Vietnam. And the quote is, bomb them back to the Stone Ages. Nixon also began secretly bombing Laos and Cambodia, those no neighboring nations that the Ho Chi Minh Trail went through to stop the supply of goods to South Vietnam. And so this is the Nixon, Nixon doctrine. The United States would honor its existing defense commitments, but in the future, Asians and other countries have to fight their own wars. Like, hey, we'll help you for now, but in the future, we're not going to bail you out. We don't really care about the domino theory anymore. Soldiers' morale was really low at this time. There's a lot of drug abuse. There's mutiny. There's sabotage that was hurting the war effort. And the, the, pu uh, the public knows about it because of the press. The press is releasing things about soldiers smoking marijuana, getting drunk, uh, and releasing some scandalous things that happened. All of these things have happened in war before, but the press now got a hold of it and was publishing it. Um, the goals of Vietnam were vague, and so their frustration was, grew was growing. Remember, they were there to stop communism. It's not a measurable goal. Then you have the My Lai Massacre, uh, where some troops just lost it uh, and slaughtered an entire village of Vietnamese, women and children. And news of this came out. They were tried for war crimes and really, really made, turned people against the war. In fact, Veterans coming home from the war were called baby killers. They were spat upon. Uh, this kind of shows the U.S. battle deaths that they peaked in the U.S. Uh, for U.S. in 1968. And then slowly declined all the way to 72. There's actually more people that die under Nixon's uh, presidency than under Johnson's presidency. So this is Nixon's peace with honor plan, draft reform. One more draft. That's the last time the U.S. has ever had a draft, by the way. It was 1971. Might be 73 again. Uh, 71. Uh, more intensive bombing, and then more Vietnamese responsibility. 30,000 people, though, this didn't appease them. They wanted out of the war immediately, and so 30,000 people demonstrated against the war in October 1969 in D.C. Nixon sent his right-hand man, Henry Kissinger, to start peace talks. The North Vietnamese, known the United States that this was not a popular war, played a wait-and-see game. Uh, and so Nixon, who this war is supposed to be dwindling down, expands the war. Supplies to the enemy were coming largely through Cambodia, and so Nixon invaded neighboring Cambodia in April 1970, which sparked wide protests across the United States, especially on college campuses. Uh, there's outrage from Congress, there's outrage from the public. Uh, at Kent State University in Ohio, anti-war protests over the Cambodian invasion turned violent. Uh, martial law was declared, which means that there's no more civil liberties. The military was called in. On May 4th, 1970, the Ohio National Guard troops fired into a crowd of protesters, killing four college students, wounding 13. This has been immortalized in uh, Neil Young's song, Ohio. At Jackson State University in Mississippi, the same thing happened. On May 14th, two students were killed in a similar event. Twelve were wounded. They had, they had seized the, the, the dean's uh, office or, or residence uh, and barricaded themselves, and so they fired into them. Because of this, college campuses closed early across the nation uh, for fear of more demonstration and violence. Troops, after two months, withdrew from Cambodia. This is on June 29, 1970. The Senate finally repealed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which was the blank check to do whatever they wanted uh, in, in Vietnam. The House did not, though. Uh, the 26th Amendment was passed in 1971, uh, which lowered the voting age of 18. This was passed in a relatively short time, almost just about a year uh, from the time it was proposed until it was ratified. Um, people were saying, if you know, if I can go die, uh, why can't I go vote? And so this was a, a, one of the last, well, second to last amendment to the Constitution. You also have the leak of the Pentagon Papers, a leaked top secret Pentagon study uh, of Kennedy and Johnson's administration's approach to Vietnam. It included that basically the Gulf of Tonkin incident was provoked. They meant to do it. So, China. Nixon decides that he wants to cool down, pump the brakes on the Cold War. Uh, just a little review. The Chinese, the communists took over in 1949. 
Uh, and it used to, the United States used to think that, well, they're communists, the Soviets are communists, they're probably buddies, they probably hang out and go get pizza together or something, probably not pizza, uh, but I don't know, like borscht and Kung Pao chicken or something. Uh, what was learned, though, through intelligence and through Vietnam is that they actually distrust and feared the Soviets, and so Nixon kind of jumped on this and said, whoa, 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 they don't like the Soviet Union? It's kind of like when you find out that you and a person you sit by hate the same person so now you become best friends like oh you hate that guy too well we're from you want to be best friends you want to go eat uh guacamole you want to do karate in the garage nixon helped uh, that recognizing china as an actual country instead of the island of taiwan would end the war in vietnam uh, and so in 1970 he simply stated i i'd like to go to china someday mm -hmm. uh -huh. and so just by him stating that um they invited our ping pong team like oh you want to play ping pong and so the U.S. sent their ping pong team and they played some exhibitions between the U.S. and China and they destroyed us because they're really good at it. Meanwhile, there were secret diplomatic talks happening behind the scenes that led to the opening of trade. This was in Forrest Gump as well. Henry Kissinger went there in secret. Uh, he's an advisor and then later Secretary of State for Nixon in April 1971. Nixon then visits in 1972. He's the first president to ever go to China. Uh, and this is the first formal contact between the United States and the Chinese in 25 years. Because of it, diplomatic relations opened in 1979. Eventually, the United States recognizes the Chinese government. Uh, and we're still kind of in a really tough situation with the Chinese, but this was a sparkling success. Uh, it went really well. There's a good video on YouTube about it uh, made by the BBC. You might want to check it out. So because of that, the Soviets are like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. You're hanging out with China? Like, well, Nixon, aren't you going to come visit us now? Uh, and so they invited Nixon to Moscow. And he went there in May 1972. Um, the Soviets wanted to prevent a U.S.-Chinese alliance. And so they hoped to gain access to American technology, our computer technology, and also American grain. The Soviets are spending so much money on the Cold War and the arms race, they're bankrupting their country. Uh, now, the guy that met with Nixon is Leonid Brezhnev. Leonid Brezhnev. Leonid Brezhnev. Um, they worked on SALT, which is a strategic arms limitation treaty, uh, and also the AMV, which is an anti-missile something, uh, which restricted nuclear missiles for five years. The anti-ballistic missile treaty they worked on, these are actually, they just did some talks. They don't actually work them out. Uh, and so this achieved detente, which is a thaw. It's a French word for easing the tension, not like Chubbs and Happy Gilmore. Ease the tension, just ease the tension, baby. Um, they relaxed the tensions between the Soviet Union and China and the United States. And so the Cold War is not so, I'm going to destroy you and nuke you off the face of the earth. Nixon is a really good president in terms of foreign policy. Here's uh, Nixon's balancing act between the Chinese summit and the USSR summit. Now in Latin America, Nixon doesn't take such a... Uh, passive stance let's say uh he he's okay with you know hanging out with communists in moscow and beijing not okay with it in in, in the sphere of influence in the united states and so he tries to prevent communism in latin america uh, in 1970 a marxist salvador allende took over chile uh who was a marxist uh, and he had leanings he wasn't a full-fledged communist but he had socialist leanings and so because of this uh he seized american business the cia backed augusto pinochet who's pictured here uh, to overthrow the government. Uh, they, they staged a coup with CIA um, help. Uh, Allende was killed. And Pinochet becomes this dictator for nearly 30 years. He's a her horrible, terrible ruler. Uh, he puts people in prison camps. He has people ex exterminated or executed. In fact, he was tried for war crimes about 10 years ago um, after he was ousted and finally kicked out of power. Uh, he was dying of cancer, and so they're like, hey, you know, why do we have to put him on trial? And he was so bad, they insisted while he was dying of cancer to be put on trial for war crimes and made him fly to, I think, Belgium or France or something. And so Nixon pursues detente across the globe, just doesn't do it in Latin America. Not in our neighborhood, not in the United States' neck of the woods. This picture is so bizarre. I feel like it's like the like he's going to drop a mixtape or something. I don't know. Um, I hope this helps. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, Oh boy, the 70s.